Welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. When you lead from a base of expertise, your confidence and credibility are derived from your knowledge. People follow you as a result. However, when you take a stretch assignment and span outside of your comfort zone, leading requires a different approach. One of influence, inspiration, compromise, and courage. We are here to talk about how to take that next step and keep going. Now, here is your host, Wanda Wallace. Welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. In this interview, I'm going to talk to an entrepreneurial leader, and we're going to focus on the leadership journey, in particular, this transition from being an expert leader to leading at a larger scale and experiences and insights along the way. So I think you're going to find this as both an informative and inspirational conversation. My guest today is Allison Arzino. Allison is CEO of Assurance, which is a direct consumer platform that transforms the buying experience for individuals seeking personalized health and financial wellness solutions. So Allison joined Assurance in 2017 as chief data scientist, and then she spent her career, by the way, modeling ways that data science can help people address their most important challenges from personal health to personal finance, and as well as teaching others how to find those answers in the data for themselves. Now, previous to Assurance, um, she's applied her expertise to help bolster the heart health as CEO of a heart wearable, health wearables startup, and to identifying promising applications of data analytics as a consultant at Sequoia Capital. She's co-author of a book called The Analytics Edge, which is a textbook on business analytics that she developed while she was a lecturer at MIT. She's taught data science at Stanford Graduate School of Business, and she earned her PhD from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology as well. Allison, welcome to the show. Thank you, Wanda, for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm super excited about it because I think you have a fascinating journey, and I think it's an inspirational journey. So I said Assurance is a direct consumer platform that transforms transforms the buying experience for individuals seeking personalized health and financial wellness solutions. Okay, that's the advertising tagline. Can you please translate what Assurance is about and what's the vision for the company? Yeah, happy to. So I would say at Assurance, we're really all about combining the art of a financial advisor with the science of data and using uh, models and algorithms to deliver a better ultimate solution for consumers. So that combination of art and science or models and experts in using technology to make the financial advisor even more powerful for the consumer. Um, And we were founded five years ago, uh, acquired by Prudential two years ago, which was a a great success story for us as a company. But we have a ton left to do to fulfill uh, our mission that you described um, and really get more personalized recommendations in front of consumers. I love that art and science, the combination of the art of a financial advisor and the science of data and analytics solutions sounds fascinating. Um, Is this trying to be a robotics solution, you know, an automation solution, or is this about sort of supporting the two? It's more about supporting the two, to be honest. So we believe pretty strongly that the best use of models and algorithms and data science in general is to help the the human. Um, so having you know modeled back model backed humans um, becoming better experts in their field, and that's what we're trying to do for the the licensed agent of insurance products and for financial advice more more generally. Get the human touch of of somebody who's there really trying to help you but know that it's backed by data and models and um, everything that you can get from, from having that knowledge as well. Okay. Sounds like what Jeff Schwartz, who's been a guest on the show, talks about as superhuman or super team, is that you make the human even better by backing them with models and with data. Okay. I like yeah, that. Exactly. Nice, nice, interesting. All right. So how big is Assurance at the moment? Like how many people do you have? Yeah, so we have just over a thousand people. Um, Two thirds of those people are licensed agents who are located all over the country uh, and who sell different insurance products for us on our platform. And about three to four hundred of those individuals are um, on our, our various teams in our headquarters, including data science, but also engineering, marketing, sales, and operations. 
Okay, that's a pretty dramatic growth. And if you were founded five years ago, that sounds like an explosive growth, which it makes for an interesting story in and of itself. All right, I'm going to shift from assurance, and I want to talk about you. And what I'm interested in is your career. And I'm going to ask a really unfair question at the very beginning, which is, and I'm going to tell you the story for why I asked this question. We all talk about having our own unique superpower. And when I talk to seasoned executives, many of them are clear about what they think their one real gift is that they keep using over and over. It's not like that's the only thing that they do or have to learn how to do, but they're very clear about what they think is their gift. So I'm curious, what do you think makes you successful today? That's a, that's a great question, Wanda. So I, you know, it's funny because I don't think a ton about my personal success, um, but I think a great deal about whether or not I'm helping a company to be successful or I'm helping the organization to be successful. Um, and, And that's what I've done, not just at Assurance, but in every step of my journey is say, what is the role I should be in to add the most value to this organization? Um, and that's what I try to focus on. And I think it has served me pretty well uh, so far. Love that reframing. And I'm sure so does everybody else listening to this one as well. Okay. When you start to analyze, how am I going to be helpful? Um, how am I going to add value? What do you think is core for your adding value to assurance at the moment? Yeah, I love operating at the intersection of data science and business. Um, And I did as the head of data science for the organization and constantly saying, how are we solving the business problems of this organization? And I love doing it now in the CEO role as well and saying, how can I use data um, to make better decisions for the company? So that idea of operating at the intersection, using the knowledge of um, business and your intuition and your experience, but then also relying on data and being grounded grounded in what you can be from a quantitative perspective, um, I think is a, a great place to be. I have a feeling a lot of people would aspire to work at places that do exactly that, and I'm sure a lot of leaders do as well. All right, so let's talk about transitions. So I believe that in every career, there are lots of, you take lots of opportunities. Some of them work out to be brilliant. Some of them work out not to be quite as brilliant as you thought. I want to focus on the more brilliant ones, the ones that where you really take a risk you um, and succeed, and that catapults you to the next level. So I'm interested in one of those transitions for you. Tell us a little bit about what happened, what got you on the path. And then I have a whole host of questions like who's helped you and how and who did you lean on to for advice and so on. But tell us about what happened in this transition. Yeah, sure. So before joining Assurance, uh, as you mentioned, I was helping to lead a heart health wearables company called Qantas. And that startup uh, is an example of one that didn't succeed. Um, we ended up closing down the startup and, and calling it a day. Uh, no big acquisition, no uh, exciting exit, which happens a lot. Um, and it was, it was tough. It was hard to uh, you know, be part of that and see that we weren't able to make it succeed. And at that time, one of the uh, venture capitalists who was working with Qantas, um, who I respected a great deal, gave me some advice and said, you know, Allison, just wait a few months and try to find the the next best opportunity, but don't rush into anything. Uh, And of course, I took the opposite advice. I decided to do a thousand things. Um, So I started consulting for a VC firm. I started consulting for a bunch of different companies in addition to continuing to teach at Stanford. And one of those companies was Assurance. And a few months into that, I decided to stop all other consulting and just join Assurance. And that was a big risk for me because Assurance was a completely different industry. I had never worked in the insurance industry before. I had mostly done healthcare. Uh, and it was a, a 
unknown company. It was not even located where I was located. It was up in Seattle. Um, it had no press and no knowledge, no VC funding at all, which is a um, common measure of success for startups. Yeah. Um, but I really believed in the people and the team and how they were approaching the problems. And what I had learned, if anything, from my past experience was the people really matter and the team that you're working with really matters. And so that's why I jumped in and said, let's give this uh, assurance thing a shot. Okay, so that was bold. Here you have some of your best advisors telling you, just wait, and you jump into consulting. Lots of consulting practices going and presumably could have built an entire career around consulting. At least that's what it looks like you were on the track to do. And you threw it all in for one company. Wow. Yeah, it, um, it uh, was a... It, it was a little bit scary in that it, it was um, becoming a consultant was something I was thinking about doing, just starting my own consultant firm. I had a textbook. I was a lecturer. Um, I could uh, focus on doing that. Uh, but, it, you know, as a consultant, you you both get to influence everything and really be part of nothing to some extent. Uh, and so I wanted to get back on the ground and be part of truly building uh, this company. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. All right, so how nervous were you? You've made the commitment, you're going to assurance. Do you have any moments of doubt in the early days? You know, I didn't. And part of that was because I had this really nice safety blanket called Stanford. Um, and so being a lecturer and having that part-time job uh, gave me a bit of security to say, worst case scenario, if this startup fails, just like my previous startup did, I'm still going to land on my feet because I have this safety blanket of Stanford. But beyond that, I had experienced what, what happened when a startup failed. And while it was painful um, and while it wasn't a fun experience necessarily, it wasn't the end of the world. And so through that experience, I, I got to tell myself, you know what? The worst thing that happens is that the startup doesn't succeed. And that's not so bad. Right. So every time I ask leaders this question, they tell the story with a lot of confidence. And it sounds like, you know, at each step along the way, they had enormous confidence. And we all marvel at that. Did you really have that much confidence at each step along the way? Were there moments when you doubted? Oh, absolutely. I would say that there were more moments when I doubted than moments with, uh, <laughs> with pure confidence. Um, but I, but I think that the, the doubt, in my opinion, and saying, you know what, I'm not sure if this is the right solution, and I'm not 100% confident that this is the right path, to me, that's what allows you to keep your eyes open and to make the right tweaks or adjustments as you go, because you're constantly saying, is this the right choice? What about right. this? Should I think about that instead? Right. So I get, then that's the same thing I hear from everybody, that there are certainly moments of doubts, but you go ahead and do it anyway. And that the past experiences, particularly one that hadn't worked so well, you realized it wasn't the end of the world. And even if it fails again, so big deal. You have a backup plan if all else fails. And you think it kind of keeps your, your uh, eyes on focus or on edge just a tiny bit to make sure you've done all the right thinking and processing and analyzing. Okay. Did you have advisors? Do you have mentors along the way? Do you have people to you go to advice? I mean, who has been there and how have they helped? Yeah, I would say, you know, professional and personal help. Um, so, for example, my, my husband's always been a great supporter and um, somebody I can turn to and bounce around ideas and uh, have that personal push in the right direction and, and personal support. Uh, you know, professionally, I would say most, I, I've been lucky that most of the, the bosses I've had, most of the academic advisors I had along the journey were, were huge supporters. And they were all very different and had different perspectives and gave me different advice. Um, but I knew that they were all trying to push me in a, a positive direction and were there to bounce around ideas or ask questions or absorb their uh, their experiences and, and their thoughts. Okay. So sounds like a collection of advisors with sometimes I'm imagining very diametrically opposed 
sets of advice about what you should do, but nevertheless, feeling that there are people you can go to for advice along the way. Is there anything that, you know, and you don't need to name the person, but that somebody did that you think was particularly helpful for you in building your career? Yeah, I, I think, you know, going back to the example of Qantas again, I stepped into the CEO role because the the CEO at the time, she had confidence in me that I could do it. Um, and that was a big leap for me to go from, um, again, in that situation, leading the data science efforts to becoming the CEO. It was also at a time when the company was trying to figure out how to salvage the, the situation and, and the operations of it. And she, without question, said, Allison, you can do this. Like The company needs you to step into this role and needs you to take this on and see what you're, you're capable of and what the company's capable of. And I'm confident that, that you can do it. And her kind of unwavering confidence in me, um, while I still had doubts, um, it was very helpful in me saying, okay, let's give it a shot. I've heard that from a number of people, male and female, that um, not wanting to let down somebody you admire and respect, who's a little more senior their confidence in you says, well, their judgment is generally pretty good. I'm not going to second guess their judgment and using that to kind of bolster, okay, I'll go ahead. And then each step you sort of get in, figure out what to do. And as you take steps, you tend to get a little more confidence. Sounds. Yeah, definitely. I think the having confidence of others that you respect, I think is even more important in some scenarios than your own confidence. Um, because you can look to that person, you can see, you know, that they have confidence in you, you have enormous respect for that individual. So of course, you must be able to do it. And it makes it much easier to dive in. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How about networking? How important has networking been to you? How do you go about networking? Do you I mean, everybody has a pro and con on networking. How do you think about building your network? Yeah, so I I don't think a ton about networking specifically, but I love learning. Um, and so when I go to a conference or when I talk to people or when I'm in a scenario that others would refer to as a, a networking opportunity, I see it more as a learning opportunity, if that makes sense. So I'll uh, you know have a conversation with somebody and and know that. I have something to learn from them. Um, if I ask them some questions, if I hear about their job or their personal situation even, or their thoughts and ideas, um, I walk away better because of it, uh, because I've learned something from them and the other way around as well. And so I, I think if we view it more as learning and growth opportunities versus networking, which I think can sometimes have a, a, a strange feeling to it, it, it becomes a bit easier. Great. All right. So now being acquired by Prudential, you're now with a large organization and a very different cultural organization than Assurance. So it's not a startup. It's been around for a long, long, long time. It has its own standard ways of doing business. No discredit to either side of the company at all. But now there's a need to build a network within this big company. How are you thinking about doing that? Yeah, it's a great question. So as you said, you know, Assurance and Prudential are different companies in, in so many ways in terms of size, in terms of number of years they've been in business, in terms of, you know, core cultural attributes, but we have great respect for each other. And so it's, it's a lot of fun, to be honest, to meet people throughout Prudential because they have a lot of curiosity about Assurance and being part of a startup and what that feels like. But then I have a lot of curiosity about this uh, big corporation and and what it's like on their side. So, uh, you know, I, I try to approach most of the conversations with that lens. And again, trying to say, how do we learn about each other? The, the pros of the company that we're in, but the cons of the companies mm -hmm. that we're in mm -hmm. as well. And ultimately, hopefully in a few years, be in a place where we've taken the best of both worlds and, and combined mm -hmm. that together. I love the optimism that comes from this one. All right, so fine. Let's flip the tables, though. As you've already said, not everything goes well in career. So you take this choice to go to this heart or health wearable device company, Qantas, and it doesn't work. 
I'm assuming that's not the only thing that you've done in your career that didn't work as planned and sometimes didn't work as planned because there was a mistake. Sometimes you made a bad judgment. Sometimes things just go differently than you planned. Sometimes the market turns on you. So a host of reasons for a setback. And what I'm interested in is a time you took a risk and it didn't go to plan. And how did you recover? Yeah, I think, you know, both with Qantas, but also um, out of my PhD, I decided to do a startup as well. Um, so so two different startups uh, that I was a big part of before joining Assurance, and, and neither of them succeeded. I think the one out of my PhD was particularly personal because uh, it, it was my work. It was the the PhD thesis that I had toiled over for years and years. And um, it's not that the company didn't succeed. The company is still around. I chose to leave um, and I chose to move and, and relocate. And that was that was really hard to walk away and say, um, I'm going to walk away from this thing that I've personally invested myself in for you know, seven, eight years. Um, but I, I want to move. I want to move back to the West Coast. At the time I was on the East Coast, I moved out to the West Coast and, and try something different um, and take a risk in uh, joining this, this heart health wearables company and taking a lecture position at Stanford, uh, moving back to where my family was. Um, and that was definitely hard, um, but ultimately I think helped me to uh, see different opportunities and and get on a better career path. Yeah, I think having some things that don't go to plan, in fact, multiple things that don't go to plan, is part of what gives you the courage to take the next risk and to figure out, well, if it doesn't work, there's always a fallback. I've always got other things. But I can't imagine having done the late having done a PhD and know what the labor is behind getting that dissertation done and defended and published and creating a company out of it and then you're going to leave it. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. how did how did what did you, what gave you the courage to do that? I mean I know you wanted to get back to the West Coast with family, but it's still hard. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I think it was um it, to some extent, it was almost the end of the chapter. Uh, it was still hard. It was it was like, you know, you're reading this really good book and this really good novel and, and you don't want it to end. But also when you get to the end, you it's easy to accept like, okay, yeah, it should be over. This should be the end of it. And in a way, when I left the, the startup coming out of my thesis, it was hard, but it also felt like, a good closing point and and I felt ready in a sense to move on to the next thing. Um, and and that's what gave me the courage and that I felt like if I hadn't tried that next thing, I wouldn't have known what else was out there or what other opportunities were were available. All right. And did you have the sense that you'd done as much as you could do at this startup? Or was it just really I need to experience something new? This can't be all there is. You know, I think a little bit of both, honestly. It, it, um, I don't think the startup necessarily needed me and my skill set to to go to the next level and to be a bigger mm-hmm. company. Um, I also, uh, you know, knew that I wanted to build something you know, that was, that was going to be great and, and really help consumers forward. And we were making some progress, but the startup was turning more into a consultancy firm, honestly, than a, a consumer facing product. Um, and so that's what kind of gave me the, the push to say, you know what, let's try something else. Okay. I get it. Um, I think that's that the first one you said that feeling that it didn't meet my, uh, it didn't need my skills or me necessarily, to be able to go to the next level. I hear that from a number of people as they make a decision to move from one company to the other or to take a leap that I'm just going to leave this comfort zone and hope that something else comes back. Um, Recently, I talked to a very senior woman who says, you know, the job that I'm in, you need me to do umpteenth millionth changes to the PowerPoint presentation. And while I'm perfectly capable of doing it, and here's the umpteenth and one version of that PowerPoint presentation to go to the board, 
and I can do that and I can present to the board, but it isn't what I love and isn't really, you're not getting the value out of me. And that was the catalyst for her being able to have a very good exit experience. Everybody feels good and she goes on to the next other big and most fascinating thing to do. So it's a common, it seems to me that that's a common thing, that taking stock and saying, I'm not sure this is the best use of my skills or my interests. Yeah. And, and I think going back to, to the beginning, really, to me, it's a question of what are you capable of doing? What can you do? And then what does the company need you to do? What does your business need you to do? And I think if you're, if you're really spending your time and energy on the latter, on things that your skill set is needed for, uh, that's going to be not only more beneficial for you as an individual, but for the company as a whole. Right. Good question. I'm going to add that to my career set of questions. If how do you evaluate where you're going your career? One is what are you capable of? And then two is what do the company need you to do? And when those two misalign, now we, we've we got some challenges. Okay. So you have a setback. You're leaving this company. It's not a major setback because it feels like it's turned out to be a good thing, or you've learned to tell yourself the good story along the way. You lead this company, Qantas, it dissolves, it goes away. Do you have any particular advice for recovery, you know, for picking yourself back up, for getting back on track? Yeah, I I think, you know, as I mentioned before, I was very fortunate to have that safety blanket of, of being a lecturer. And I think there's something to that, right? And coming up with what your what your security blanket is going to be. What is your fallback? And maybe it's not great. Maybe you don't love your fallback and it's not something you're horribly passionate about, but it's a fallback. And so as you take a risk, as they don't work out, it, it can really diminish the, the fear of taking that risk because you know, hey, worst case scenario, I have this fallback and I can go back to this other thing. Um, you know, and I've, I've talked to people before who are, um, you know, scared to join a startup and they don't want to leave the big company they're at and leave that position. And what I say to them is, well, what's the worst case scenario that startup doesn't work out and, and you can jump back and, and, you know, move back into that corporate position. I'm sure they'd love to have you. Yeah. <laughs> How about the personal side, Allison? Were there any sense of, I failed? Did you ever have that experience of feeling that you didn't do something you should have done? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that that's, uh, that's natural and it would be hard not to feel that way, especially when you're sitting at the helm of a startup that doesn't succeed and, and you're there to make it succeed and it fails. <laughs> um, it was, I think, tough for me personally, but the hardest part for me was turning around to all of the employees and saying, We didn't make it. We failed. We tried really hard and we did a ton and it's not because of all of you, um, but it didn't work out. Um, That was definitely challenging. All right. So how did you get over that sense of, oh my gosh, I failed? You know, I don't know if I did get over it as much as just accept that that's, that's part of life in a sense, right? Like I failed. And I think I sat with that for a while and I still would look at that and say, I failed. I did. I, I did not make that company uh, have a successful exit. Um, and with that part of my job and, and with that assignment, I failed. But did I fail in learning something? Did I fail in finding a growth path? Did I fail in taking everything I could out of it? No. And so I was able to come out of that and say like, yes, in that moment for that company, I did fail, um, but that doesn't mean I didn't get anything out of it. I got it. I got it. And I can imagine standing in front of the, the team of employees and saying, okay, we failed. We didn't make it. I mean, all, all that goes with that is, you know, livelihoods and health and well-being and all that yes. is a big challenge. Okay. Allison, I love your optimism. I love the sense that regardless what it is, there is another chapter, another day, another way, a different path. If not here, there's somebody out somewhere else. It, have you always been that optimistic? It's a good question. Um, you know, I think so. Uh, but that being said, Wanda, I wouldn't say I'm optimistic every day. Um, and, and there are definitely some days where I don't want to be as optimistic. <laughs> um, and you, you get a little discouraged and you say, you know what, today, 
I just want to not be as optimistic. <laughs> um, but but I've always found that being optimist, optimistic never hurts and always helps. Um, and so if you can look at something in a more positive way, it's only going to benefit you. And I don't think it, it will ever hold you back or, or cause you to, to lose an opportunity. Well, I personally believe it's virtually impossible to lead without a healthy degree of optimism. Now, optimism doesn't mean rosy colored glasses. It just means the ability to see the next step forward and believe that there is a way forward. I don't think people follow you if there's not a sense of optimism, provided you've got realism attached to that one, because we don't want to follow you over the cliff. Thank you very much. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, when I think about what kind of leader I would want to work for and follow. Um, I don't want to hear them being negative. I don't want them to say that it's tough or hard or, you know, we can't make it work or we can't do it. That's discouraging. Um, And it's just, even if it's true, you don't want to hear that from your leader. And so I think I have a responsibility as the leader to, to show up and be optimistic and push everybody to say, we can do anything. Um, let's figure out what we should be doing. Love that. We can do anything. Let's figure out what we should should be doing. Okay. So if I sort of summarize all of these, taking risks is part of learning and learning is what drives you, whether it's about networking with people or about opportunities or about a PhD thesis or about starting a company or changing jobs. I've got to find some place that I'm learning. That's what fuels you. In that same sense of learning, even when there are setbacks, even things that you failed to do the way you had expected to do them. It's a matter of saying, what am I taking from this? Yes, I'm going to not feel great about it, but what am I taking? What are the successes? What what am I taking from it? What are the lessons that I'm taking forward and going forward? Um, Having that fallback plan sounds like your safety valve, safety blanket you've used to describe along the way. And I think also part of what boosts confidence for you is that you know there is something else that you could be doing. Even if it's not appealing, there's something else. And I also hear in that having people around you who believe in you, that you respect and admire, who say, you can do this, Allison, go for it, come on, is also part of what fuels you to go forward. I think in a passion, a passion about something you want to create in the world. Yeah, definitely. I get that? All right. Sounds great. Okay, we're going to take a break at this point. When you come back, I want to talk about the transition now into CEO and sort of what you've learned and your advice for other people who want to be CEO and all those sort of things. So my guest today is Allison Arzino. She's CEO of Assurance, which is a direct consumer platform transforming the buying experience for individuals seeking personalized health and financial wellness solutions. I like the notion that it's the merger of the art of a financial advisor with the data and models that make that financial advisor superhuman. How's that for a new advertising slogan? All right, and we'll be right back. This is Wanda Wallace, host of Out of the Comfort Zone. Do you find yourself in a role where your team knows more than you know? Are you struggling to see how you now add value? For years, I've coached leaders who have moved beyond the comfort zone of their expertise and have developed a methodology to help them make the leap and go on to do more. All of those tips are now packed into my new book, You Can't Know It All. Visit our website at leadership-forum.com or tune in to Out of the Comfort Zone for more insight. If you want more information on the articles, books, coaching, and seminars we offer, go to our website at www.leadershipforuminc.com. You're sure to find some helpful links, videos, and more to help you create a winning strategy for your organization. Leadership Forum, Inc., helping organizations get it and keep it. Hi, I'm Wanda Wallace, host of Out of the Comfort Zone. We have some amazing guests with some incredibly good ideas about how to take your leadership to the next level. But I find people are looking for more practical ways of implementing those ideas. So we've created an individual subscription service specifically to focus on how to apply. You'll find more about that at www.outofthecomfortzone.com. We have two additional subscription services, one for the social group that want to exchange ideas and perspectives with a group and talk about career advancement. And we have a master's level for people who want to take a deeper dive, all on outofthecomfortzone.com. We hope you'll join us. 
If you want more information on the articles, books, coaching, and seminars we offer, go to our website at www.leadership-forum.com. You're sure to find some helpful links, videos, and more to help you create a winning strategy for your organization. Leadership Forum, helping organizations get it and keep it. When it comes to business, you'll find the experts here. Voice America Business Network. You are listening to Out of the Comfort Zone. To reach Dr. Wanda Wallace or her guest, call into the program at 1-866-472-5790. Again, that's 1-866-472-5790. You may also send an email to wanda.wallace at leadership-forum.com. Now, back to Out of the Comfort Zone. Welcome back to the show. With me today is Allison Erzino. She's CEO of Assurance, and we have been talking about Allison's career, the setbacks and the successes of the career. And I walk away from this with a couple of conclusions Number one conclusion I hear from absolutely every senior executive I have ever interviewed in any country, anywhere around the world in over 20 years of doing these kind of interviews. Number one, there are some successes and there are some setbacks. And if you haven't had any setbacks, then you don't know what risks are the right risks to take. Yes, recovering from those setbacks is not necessarily easily. There's a personal sense of I failed, and there's also a learning to accept that failure and moving forward. And from Allison, we learned the power of knowing that you have a plan, a fallback plan, even if you don't love it, um, that you're going to take something that you've learned from it and that you're going to go on to the next thing, something very similar that I hear from other executives. The one big thing I take away from Allison, which I think I probably should have known anyway, I've always known that having somebody who's more senior to you, who has confidence in you, is a booster for your own confidence. But Allison has highlighted for me the power of having somebody who's more senior that you highly respect. So if you respect them, you have to respect their judgment. And that's like just adding several points to your confidence Uh, I think I need a new one, confidence quotient, and maybe somebody's already done that. I think they called it confidence code, but there we are. All right, Allison, I want to shift now from talking about past and careers and transitions and what gets you ready for today. And I want to talk about now being the CEO. And I don't know if you want to tell the story about how it is you became CEO, but what I'm interested in knowing is what have you learned in this transition now to being a CEO? Yeah, so in terms of uh, becoming CEO, I stepped into the president role last fall um, here at Assurance, and our former CEO uh, decided to take on a broader strategic advisory role uh, within Prudential and help take some of what makes Assurance special um, and spread it throughout the, the enterprise. And so it gave me the opportunity to step into the CEO role. Um, and it's a tough job, I would say. Um, and the, the hardest part for me is not, um, it's not running the business necessarily, or, um, you know, figuring out our strategy or what we should do next. It's the, it's the inner game of being a CEO. It's making sure that you're being as optimistic as possible, but also grounding everybody in the reality of the situation. It's, um, you know, making sure that there's enough chaos in the company to create innovation and, and find new ideas, but also that, you know, we're putting processes in place and we're orderly and we're marching in the right direction. It's the, you know, needing to show that confidence while also maintaining your own humility. Uh, those conflicts and those internal uh, games that you have to play and, and make sure you're landing on the right side is is definitely a challenge. Okay, now that is music to my ears, as I think you already know, because I believe the art of leadership is for any quality you would describe a great leader does, it's learning to do the polar opposite and to hold those two in balance. And let's take an example You know, we want our leaders to be great communicators. We want them to stand up and give amazing speeches and, you know, say all the right things and be very vocal and outgoing and so on. But if you do too much of that, you you kill some other people speaking up and it feels like it's all you 
in the center of the room. You have to learn to do the polar opposite, which is largely shut up and listen. And I contend that there is no quality that doesn't require the balance. And I love that you say the hardest part is that inner game of creating the balance. The optimism, but grounded in reality, enough chaos for innovation, but processes that make us run efficiently, showing confidence and at the same time having humility that makes you feel like an authentic leader. Wow. So how do you keep those components, that inner game in check? What's the secret for you? Yeah, I think the what I try to do is observe others, other leaders, other employees, colleagues throughout Prudential or at other companies, um, and try to notice times where I feel like they're too extreme on one side or the other of one of these balancing games. Um, And if I can observe that happening, it reminds me um, that it's important. And so if you see somebody else, you know, being too realistic and not optimistic enough, Um, you know, promoting too much order and not allowing the chaos, Um, being too confident and it makes it seem like they're not humble. It just reminds you how important it is. Uh, It doesn't necessarily make it any easier, I would say, um, but definitely serves as a helpful reminder if you're constantly looking for situations where people are skewing too far one way or, or another. So let me turn a little bit to advice. I talk to a lot of people, particularly a lot of younger women who say that they would like to be a CEO, that that's their aspiration is somebody someday to be a CEO. And I'm interested in your advice for women or men, for that matter. What do you think they need to do or to experience or uh, anything that's going to make them a great CEO? Yeah, I think in some ways, and this is going to sound weird at first, but in some ways, being a CEO is a selfless thing on behalf of the company. So yes, you're in this position of power and yes, you have this great title um, and, and all of the benefits that come with that, but you also, your role exists, your job exists on behalf of the company. Um, you know, I always say to all of our employees, like, I am here to support you. I am here to help you in your job. I don't get to build models anymore or, you know, tweak the data or um, build the things we're building. I get to support those who are. And so in, in that way, you know, no matter what job you're in, saying to yourself, how do I practice that art of being selfless? How do I say, I'm going to give my full self into whatever it is I'm doing right now, whatever that job is, whatever that team is, whatever that company is. Um, and if you're truly doing that, uh, then I do believe that, that that CEO path will will come to you at some point. But it's also great practice for what it would be like to actually be the CEO is, it can you be completely selfless and 100% give yourself into the company, the people, the team, and, and the mission? All right. I have two reactions to this one. First reaction is, I believe you're right. In the CEO position, you actually can't do anything. You have the ultimate power and authority, but the moment you try to use it to do something, you're undermining your team or your employees of using and exercising their own power and feeling excited about what they're doing. So it's an odd conundrum. I have all this power and I can't actually use it. Your power is about resources or people in positions. That's about it. So that's the first reaction. I don't think people think about that as a CEO. I think they think about the CEO as the person who makes all the decisions and, you know, mm, sort of, maybe, kind of finalize the decisions, but it can't be all yours. So I think you're right that you, we say that it is the ultimate selfless act. And that doesn't mean that you never are protecting yourself or looking out for yourself. It's the ultimate selfless act. All right. So to think about somebody who wants to be a CEO who can practice at times being a little selfless and leading from a selfless position, I suspect would come as a bit of shock to a lot of folks who are aspiring to be at the top of the organization. Mm -hmm. I agree. Easier said than done. Absolutely. And and one of my favorite leadership books actually talks about um, taking out the trash as a leader, okay. right? So can you, um, 
are you willing to take out the trash in that? Are you willing to do whatever act, whatever um, job your team needs you to do that you're asking others to do as well um, on behalf of the broader company? So that is one kind of concrete thing I would encourage people to do is identify the job or the task that most people don't really want to do and, and dive in there and do it yourself. Right. Now, I would say make sure that's not all you're doing, because if all you're taking out the trash, Absolutely. we're not going to call you CEO. So we don't want you just doing all the housekeeping around the, the organization. But not being afraid to do some of those is also a really good sign, I think. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Let's try to talk about advice for women. Um, do you have any particular advice for women? You know, one of my employees asked me recently, he has a, a teenage daughter and a teenage son. And he asked me, uh, you know, any advice for how to make sure his daughter, you know, believes that she can uh, be anything she wants to be and pursue a career in, in a technical field or become a programmer or a data scientist. And, and my reaction to him was, like, stop talking about your daughter like she's any different than your son. Um, you know, stop focusing on their their difference in gender, the fact that, you know, you have a daughter and a son. And just think about the fact that you have two kids who are going to be passionate about something and should have the opportunity to figure out what they like and what they're passionate about in general. Um, and so, you know, I had the the privilege of growing up always believing I could do anything. And it was just a matter of what I wanted to do. Um, and I think that's the most important thing that we could do for, for women is from a very early age, emphasizing that, frankly, your gender doesn't really matter in terms of being something that holds you back from, from doing whatever you want to do. That is an interesting one. And were your parents, like, was your mom a working mother? I mean, did you did you have that model growing up? She was not. I had a, a stay-at-home mom. Most of the women in my family were either stay-at-home moms or uh, had careers as teachers or, or receptionists. Um, so there was no, you know, strong female uh, in the workplace for me to look at. Um, but I did have a lot of strong female influencers, you know, in my mom in terms of saying, you know, I'm going to support you in whatever you want to do, um, you know, in my, my family in general and saying, it, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, pick something you love. So, and then your father, do you think you felt like your father treated you any differently than he would have treated his son? No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. All right. I love that. Stop treating your daughter like she's different than your son. Whatever you would do with your son, do with your daughter. Whatever encouragement you give your son, encourage your daughter and let people find their own sense of passions. All right. One of the topics that we've been talking about pretty much globally, especially in the Western world, is getting more women into the STEM area, into the sciences and mathematics and data science and computer programming and all of those differences. And we know that Girls perform quite well in standardized tests up to some sort of age point, and then they tend to fall out of the sciences in general. It's not clear that I don't think that I don't think that that's a capacity. I think it's a something else issue. But what's your view and what do you think we need to be doing to keep girls pursuing science oriented careers? Yeah, I, you know, I distinctly remember multiple occasions as a young college student of, you know, friends of my parents or, you know, other adults asking me things like, you know, what are you going to do with a math degree? Or you're going to be a teacher, right? Um, and, and there was an inherent bias, I think, pushing me to question the choice of, of pursuing math as a career. Um, a bias that, Frankly, if I had been male, I, I doubt I would have gotten those same questions. Um, and to me, that's, a, that, that's what we need to solve. And I think that's part of the problem is when you see that girls are great at, at standardized tests in the STEM fields, up until they reach an age where society starts to influence mm -hmm. them a little bit more, you know that the problem is that influence society is putting on them versus, versus anything else. So to me, it comes back to us making sure as, as parents, as teachers, as adults, that we're not pushing that bias onto, onto kids, onto young adults. 
All right. So I have a to-do from parents, moms and dads, which is stop talking to her in a negative tone about a pursuit of a career or an interest in science. So questions like, what are you going to do with that? And are you going to be a teacher or, you know, what are you going to do when you have married or have children? Any of those that push her back to the traditional female models, stop asking those questions. Yeah, exactly. Ex- and, and to be fair, those paths are good too. Like those are fine. Um, and, and people should be proud if that's what they want to pursue, but it shouldn't be a bias in that direction. That's right. That's right. And instead you might ask, what do you love about math? Why do you enjoy right. math? What's interesting about it? Okay, so that is one thing. And then I think that's true for teachers as well, to be thinking about how do we encourage this as opposed to assume that you'll pursue the traditional female kind of careers and paths. Right. All right. I'm going to ask a slightly different question for male managers in particular who are looking to nurture their young female talent particularly in mathematically quantitatively oriented areas, what advice do you have for male managers about how they can be better advocates? Yeah, you know, I started going to the Grace Hopper conference a couple of years ago, and it's a great example of a conference for young women in STEM fields, um, computer programmers, but also product managers, data scientists, engineers in general. And I think, you know, when I was there, it wasn't just women attending the event. There were, there were men there as well. And I remember hearing from, from many of our data scientists and engineers here at Assurance how powerful they thought it was that the men came to the conference. So it wasn't just that they sent their, their employees to the conference themselves but they showed up. They showed up and they cared about sitting in on these sessions, about women struggling to get that next promotion, um, about really showing up and supporting. Uh, So that's something I would definitely encourage is it's great to send your your female employees to events like like the Grace Hopper Conference and others, um, but actually showing up yourself is, is even more powerful. Okay. And understanding something about the experiences of women, particularly in the science or in the quantitative oriented areas. And then as you hear those stories, I think you're going to come up with more and more examples in the ways in which you can have conversations with them, with your female colleagues and direct reports, as well as know what to do to help them out along the way. Definitely. Okay. Um, so here's the, the hard question, maybe the hardest question I'm going to ask all day why would somebody want to work for you? Yeah, that, that is a hard question, I would say, Wanda. And the best answer I have is because I know that I need to keep learning and growing to be a good leader. Um, and that's where, you know, the previous CEO of Assurance, actually, he used to always say, none of us will be qualified for the job we need to do six months from now. And I think that is really true. If we're not all constantly learning and growing and trying to figure out how we can be better, um, we're not going to be qualified in six months for our job. And I am fully dedicated to doing that myself. And I push everybody here to do that as well. Um, How can you keep being better and stronger and uh, a better leader for for your company? That's a pretty amazing pitch. Um, Anybody who wants to learn more, I'd encourage you. Here's an example of how to do that one. Uh, How should people get in touch with you if they want to reach out to you personally? Yeah, anybody is welcome to email me um, at arzino at assurance.com. I'd be happy to uh, read and respond to your email and answer any questions you might have. Okay, fabulous. All right, last question for you, just for sheer fun. um, What takes you out of your comfort zone? And how do you succeed? I think I know how you succeed, but what really takes you out of your comfort zone? Yeah, I, um, you know, one of the things that I've been working on developing and learning is is sharing more personal stories about myself. I think, you know, we talked a bit today about some personal stories more on the professional side, but uh, setbacks and failures I've encountered. But sharing more about myself personally is something that continues to take me out of my comfort zone. I think something that's also incredibly important for any leader or, um, or person who's trying to succeed professionally to do is to get people to know you personally. Um, that will, I think, continue to take me out of my comfort zone for a long time, um, but is something I'm committed to doing. 
So why do you think that's important to do the personal stories? Yeah. And, you know, I see it in others as well. When you hear somebody's personal story, when you make some connection to them, you learn more about them as an individual, as a person, you remember it and you connect to it. And when you're frustrated with them for disagreeing with you, or, you know, you don't think they're showing up and doing their best work, you remember that you know them as a person and and you have a relationship because of that. And I think it helps teams to collaborate better for, for companies to work better together and honestly for, for everyone to show up and be a better leader. I love that. So you see other people, this is the same answer you gave at the beginning. You see other people getting the balance right or not so right. And that gives you the reminder to do it differently. So you see other people sharing stories and you see how powerful that is for you, for connections, for learning about them, and for remembering about them and giving them some grace if something isn't going so well. Fabulous. Definitely. All right, Allison, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having for being a guest today. So my guest again is Allison Arzino. She's CEO of Assurance, which is a direct to consumer platform for buy, transforming buying experience. I'm going to put my words on this, which is about marrying the art of the financial advisor with the models and data and data science in the background. So we get the best of data and and humans at the same time. Allison's had a very interesting journey leading a number of different companies, as we've heard along the way, some successes in failures. And I think the thing that stands out to me in listening to you, Allison, has to do with the notion of learning, that that is just sort of the core of what drives you, what drives you to connect with people, what drives you to try new experiences, what drives you to make changes, what drives you to push ahead, what gives you in some ways the confidence to go ahead and do the next step of being a CEO. So thank you for being our guest today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Join us next week for more wisdom and getting out of your comfort zone. If you'd like to know more about how to apply some of the ideas we've talked about today, check out our subscription service at outofthecomfortzone.com. And we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us today. Tune in for another edition next week with Dr. Wanda Wallace on the Voice America Business Channel. Reach outside your comfort zone this week. 